Hey, what's up, guys? My name is Color Otanuvial, and today we are going to be starting a brand new series called The Last Wish by Anze Sokovsky. It is the book that started off the Witcher franchise, and it has quickly become one of my favorite series of all time. Uh, we are going to be continuing our Harry Potter series. I just wanted to do something a little bit different today, but without further ado, let's get on with The Last Wish by Anze Sokovsky. Calero Tunuvio presents The Last Wish by Anze Sokovsky, introducing The Witcher. The Voice of Reason, 1. She came to him toward morning. She entered very carefully, moving silently, floating through the chamber like a phantom. The only sound was that of her mantle brushing her naked skin. Yet this faint sound was enough to wake The Witcher. Or maybe it only tore him from the half-slumber in which he rocked monotonously, as though traveling through fathomless depths, suspended between the seed and its calmed surface amid gently undulating strands of seaweed. He did not move, did not stir. The girl flitted closer, threw off her mantle, and slowly, hesitantly, rested her knee on the edge of the large bed. He observed her through lowered lashes, still not betraying his wakefulness. The girl carefully climbed onto the bedclothes, and onto him wrapped her thighs around him. Leaning forward on straining arms, she brushed his face with hair which smelled of chamomile. Determined and as, and as if impatient, she leaned over him and touched his eyelids, cheeks, lips, with the tips of her breasts. He smiled very slowly, delicately, grasping her by the shoulders, and she straightened, escaping his fingers. She was radiant, luminous in the misty brilliance of dawn. He moved, but with pressure from both hands, she forbade him to change his position, and with a light but decisive movement of her hips, demand a response. He responded, she no longer backed away from his hands. She threw her head back, shook her hair. Her skin was cool and surprisingly smooth. Her eyes glimpsed when her face came close to his, were huge as and dark as the eyes of a water nymph. Rocked, he sank into a sea of chamomile as it grew agitated and seethed. The Witcher Later, it was said, the man came from the north, from Roper's Gate. He came on foot, leading his laden horse by the bridle. It was l late afternoon, and the ro Roper's, Saddler's, and Tanner's stalls were already closed. The street empty. It was hot, but the man had a black cloak thrown over his shoulders. He drew attention to himself. He stopped in front of the old narrow court inn, stood there for a moment, listened, to the hubbub of voices. As usual, at this hour, it was full of people. The stranger did not enter the old narrow court. He pulled his horse farther down the street to another tavern, a small one called the Fox. Not enjoying the best of reputation, it was almost empty. The innkeeper raised his head above a barrel of pickled cucumbers and measured the man with his gaze. The outsider still in his coat stood stiffly in front of the counter, motionless and silent. Where will it be? Beer, said the stranger. His voice was unpleasant. The innkeeper wiped his hands on the canvas apron and filled a chipped earthenware tankard. The stranger was not old, but his hair was almost entirely white. Beneath his coat he wore a leather jerkin laced up at the neck and shoulders. As he took off his coat, those around him noticed that he carried a sword. Not something unusual itself, nearly every man in wisdom carried his weapon, but no one carried a sword strapped to his back as if it were a bow or quiver. The stranger did not sit at the table with the fewer other guests. He remained standing in the corner, piercing the innkeeper with his gaze. He drew from the tankard. I'm looking for a room for the night. There's none, grunted the innkeeper looking at the guest's boots, dusty and dirty. 
Ask the old Narakot. I would rather stay here. There is none. The innkeeper finally recognized the stranger's action. He was a Rivian. I'll pay. The outsider spoke quietly, as if unsure, and the whole nasty affair began. A pockmarked bean pole of a man, who from the moment the outsider had entered had not taken his gloomy eyes off him, got up and approached the counter. Two of his companions rose behind him, no more than two paces away. There's no room to be had, you Rivian vagabond, rasped the pocket man, standing right next to the outsider. We don't need people like you and Wisdom. This is a decent town. The outsider took his tankard and moved away. He glanced at the innkeeper, who avoided his eyes. It did not even occur to him to defend the Rivian. After all, who likes Rivians? All Rivians are thieves, the pocket pockmarked man went on, his breath smelling of beer, garlic, and anger. Do you hear me, you bastard? He can't hear you. His ears are full of shit, said one of the men with him, and the second man cackled. Pay and leave, yelled the pocket man. Only now the Rivian looked at him. I'll finish my beer. We'll give you a hand, the pockmarked man hissed. He knocked the tinkered from the stranger's man, the stranger's hand, and simultaneously grabbed him by the shoulder, dug his fingers into the leather strap, which ran diagonally across the outsider's chest. One of the men behind him raised a fist to strike. The outsider curled up on the spot, throwing the pockmarked man off balance. The sword hissed in its sheath and glistened briefly in the dim light. The place seethed, there was a scream, and one of the few remaining customers tumbled toward the exit. A chair fell with a crash, and earthenware smacked hollowly against the floor. The innkeeper, his lips trembling, looked at the horribly slashed face of the pucked man who, clinging with his fingers to the edge of the counter, was slowly sinking from sight. The other two were lying on the floor, one motionless, the other writhing in a convulsing in a dark pile, dark spreading puddle. A woman's hysterical scream vibrated in the air, piercing the ears, and the innkeeper shuddered, caught his breath, and vomited. The stranger retreated toward the wall, tense and alert. He held the sword in both hands, sweeping the blade through the air. No one moved. Terror, like cold mud, was clear on their faces paralyzing limbs and blocking throats. Three guards rushed into the tavern with thuds and clangs. They must have been close by. They had trenches and trenchions wound with leather straps at the ready. By the sight of the corpses drew their swords. The Rivian pressed his back against the wall with his left hand pulled a dagger from his boot. Throw that down, one of the guards yelled with a trembling voice. Throw that down, you th you're coming with us. The second guard kicked aside the table between himself and the Rivian. Go get the men, Triska, he shouted to the third guard, who stayed closer to the door. No need, said the stranger, lowering his sword. I'll come by myself. Yo, go, you son of a bitch, on the end of the rope, yelled the trembling guard. Throw that sword down or I'll smash your head in. The Rivian straightened. He quickly pinned his blade under his left arm, and with his right hand, raced toward the guards, swiftly drew a complicated sign in the air. The clout nails which studded his tunic from his wrists to the elbows flashed. The guards drew back, shielding their faces with their arms. One of the customers sprang up while another darted to the door. The woman screamed again, wild and ear-splitting. I'll come by myself, repeated the stranger in his resounding metallic voice, and the three of you will go in front of me. Take me to the castle inn. I don't know where the way. Yes, sir, mumbled the guard. Dropping his head, he made toward the exit, looking around tentatively. The other two guards followed him out backward, hastily. The, so the stranger followed in their tracks, sheathing his sword and dagger. As they passed the tables, the remaining customers hid their faces from the dangerous stranger.